In this video, we'll talk very briefly about a very interesting topic within multilingualism, the relationship between spoken and sign languages, which encompasses questions like how are words from a spoken language borrowed into a sign language and how are sign languages represented in the schools of a society. So if you think about it, and someone who uses a sign language really needs to be at least bilingual. They need to know the sign language itself so that they can communicate with other members of the deaf community. So for example, they would need to know ASL, but they also need to know the spoken language of the territory, for example, English, so that they can read and write because all the newspapers are gonna be in English, for example, and the internet is going to be in English. There's no writing systems that are in regular use for sign languages, so text chat is going to have to be in English or through video, but if it's written, it's probably going to be in English. So this leads to several questions about how the contact works between these two languages. The first one is how are we going to borrow words from a spoken language like English into sign language? This is where finger spelling comes in. As you can see, this is the finger spelling from ASL. It's a way to import words from um, a written representation into a sign language. Uh, my name in the ASL finger spelling would be R O L A N D O. Please try to sign your name. Please pause the video. Here's something very important. Um, not all finger spelling systems are the same. Every sign language has a different type of finger spelling, depending on what written languages they will have contact with. For example, this is the one for ASL, and it has all of the, the letters, the glyphs that are contained in the English writing system. This is the finger spelling for Lesco, the sign language from Costa Rica. And as you can see, it has the letters to, uh, to import words from Spanish, which is the language that Lesco is most in contact with. And this includes um, written letters like ñ, as in año, year. So you can see that this is an element that the ASL one doesn't have. But if you look at them closely, many of them are indeed different letters. For example, R is like this. N is like this. They're all slightly different. Give it a try. Try to say your name in the um, Lesco finger spelling. Please pause the video. Right, so this is how words can be uh, borrowed into sign languages. And sign languages use these kinds of finger spelling a lot. So for example, on the left, we have the example of bear in the Latvian sign language. And the word for koala on the right is bear, K-O-A-L-A. <laughs> So you can see how it, it adds additional information and it's a way to borrow a word that might not have existed before in the Latvian sign language. When two languages are in contact, there might be intermediate forms between them, kind of like uh, the pidgins and creoles that we studied. There are contact languages between sign and spoken languages. Uh, for example, manually coded English uses hand signs but follows the grammatical structure for English. So for example, you have uh, a, a root for the verb to climb uh, said with a motion of the hands and then this for the Finnish en English ending ing, as in climbing. This one would be the plural. This one would be the adjective. You would have sleep, e, sun, so as you can see, these signs are not really part of the grammar that we have studied for uh, sign languages. They are sequential, first of all, not in parallel, as we've seen most of the morphology of sign languages is. This is used as a way to teach uh, deaf children how to read and write the spoken language, because this is the only way that they would have access to the, the information in the words, the order of the words, by representing them in signs. And these signs have the grammar of English encoded in them. And by the way, this is obviously different from a full-fledged sign language like ASL. Um, in the world, approximately 0.1% of children are born with hearing loss. But there are places in the world where there are a larger concentration of children that are born deaf. 
for example, in the village of Bengkala in Bali in Indonesia, the prevalence is about, how much is it? About 20%, uh, 20 times more, about 2% of the population of the village is born without hearing. And so all of the village has, not all, 80% of the village has become bilingual in both the spoken language Balinese and the sign language, which is Katakolok. And as you can see, the language is integrated in schools and all of society um, has joined together in using this language, just because there's a lot of people who use the sign language, Katakolok. But in most societies, again, the prevalence of children born with um, hearing loss is about 0.1%. And um, if you think about it, how can children learn sign languages? There's gonna be a couple of combinations in which this can happen. For example, maybe the parents um, are part of the deaf community and they use the language like ASL and the children are born without hearing. So the way that the sign language is going to be transmitted is just that the parents are going to naturally start signing from day one. The sign language is going to be transmitted as their L1 language or their native language. You could have a combination of non-hearing parents and a hearing child. These are called CODAs, children of deaf adults. Their parents are going to sign to them uh, from day one. So these children are going to learn a sign language as their native language, but they're going to acquire their spoken languages like English from other relatives, from other from parts of society in general. Uh, the far more common combination is hearing parents and a child who was born deaf. And so it might take some time for the parents to realize that the child can't hear them. And it just might take months, which are, as we know, critical for language learning. Remember in week five that we talked about how children have a critical period in the first couple of years of their lives when they need to learn language? If they don't receive some language input during this period of development, they will not be able to learn language well later on like if they don't hear if they don't if they don't have contact with the human language in the first years of their lives it's going to be very difficult for them to learn one when they're teenagers for example so it is important to identify them as early as possible so that they can be exposed to some human language exactly which one the parents are going to have to decide whether they want the child to be a part of the deaf community or not uh, maybe they will um, have them in contact with people who can sign a sign language so that the children can learn as early as possible. Maybe they will put them in some sort of school. And there has, has historically been a debate about how to teach deaf children. May, um, in the 1800s and early, until the 1950s, education uh, focused on orality and trying to get children to imitate the spoken language as closely as possible. But this method has proven to be not very effective. It, if children can't have access to the spoken language, then it's pretty much wasted time. The way most schools work nowadays is by making them bilingual, by having children who, uh, by having classes which are in the sign language of the community and having some languages where the children can learn about the spoken language e e uh, for the reading and writing part. Societies are different than this. For example, in places like Sweden, um, the, the deaf children might go to the same school as the hearing children, and all of them might learn about sign language, or, um, or the deaf children might learn the sign language but be in the same school as the hearing children. Maybe the deaf children are going to go into a school of their own. There's different combinations for this in society, depending, of course, on... Um, the amount of integration that you want for these children in society, which of course should be an optimal degree of integration. It's their human rights. Speaking of human rights, because it's their language, uh, people who use sign languages should have access to things like translators and courts, access to government, access in banks and so forth. And there are places where government has to provide interpretation into sign languages for official functions. This is, for example, interpretation into uh, the LESCO sign language from Costa Rica. You might have heard about cochlear implants, um, which are a type of device that is implanted near your ear and which sends electric impulses if you have hearing loss. Um, people have said, well, if everyone can uh, hear, maybe this will make sign languages disappear. But 
this is not going to happen for two reasons. First of all, cochlear implants, they can help you improve your hearing, but they cannot completely replace it. So you would need to get it very early as a child and have a lot of practice for you to be able to identify all the words. And not all children uh, can make full usage of the cochlear implant. So they will still need to learn the sign language. But most importantly, same as you place value on English or on your in the languages that you speak, people who speak sign languages have made them part of their identity. These languages are a part of the deaf community and, and they treasure them just as much as you treasure your spoken language. So they are a marker of identity. And the deaf community has always insisted that this shouldn't be treated as a disability. For example, this should be treated as uh, a minority, just a different group of people. So sign languages are probably going to continue to exist. In summary, sign languages are in contact with other languages, including spoken languages, for example, ASL and English. You can borrow words into sign languages using finger spelling. Um, deaf children might not have access to the deaf community early in their lives if their parents don't realize that they're deaf, but they should get um, input in the sign language. This is going to help them with their development of linguistic capabilities. There's many places in the world where there are schools that teach sign languages. Um, this is a development from the 1800s where uh, people thought that developing orality was better. But now we know that what really matters to the children is developing linguistic abilities in any human language. And sign languages are as perfect and as good as, as spoken languages for this. And because it's their language, uses of sign languages, of course, have human rights to access services and their governments in their language.